Hi everyone, my name is Amen and I am the Vice President here at Hubs and today I am both thrilled and honored to welcome you all to our first speaker session of the semester, a conversation with Johanna Mosca and Melissa Farah on, as I'm sure you all may know, breaking gridlock and glass ceilings. But before we get started, I do want to take a moment to, to introduce them to you all. Johanna Mosca is the current CEO at the public affairs firm Global Situation Room. Before that, she joined the Obama campaign in 2007 at the Iowa caucuses and served in the administration for seven years as a White House director of press advance, a role in which she was charged with coordinating global summits as well as shaping the image and messaging of the White House more broadly. We're also joined by Alyssa Farah, who served most recently as White House Director of Communications in 2020. Before that, served also as Special Assistant to the President, the youngest Pentagon Press Secretary in US history, as well as Deputy Assistant to the Secretary of Defense. She recently joined the International Women's Forum this past year as a visiting fellow. So we're thrilled and so excited to be joined by the two of them today and look forward to a fantastic conversation. We couldn't have worked for more different presidents. Um, I worked for Donald Trump, she worked for Barack Obama, but we are both professionally working together and are actually friends because we care about this country, we care about civil discourse, and we care about healing what is a deeply broken and polarized moment that we live in. And you all, you know, we know of you guys as young leaders and future leaders, we're the future of our country, and we want to talk to you about what we've seen, where we see things going, and to give our best advice on how our generation and the one behind us can do what they can to try to improve the direction we're heading. Yeah. And I think, Alyssa, that's why I'm so thrilled that we're here together in person because during a pandemic with an assault on our capital and this moment of deep divide, we came together because we both feel it personally. And I know we were talking before that it may get worse before it gets better. I think bipartisanship right now is not in vogue. Um, it is in vogue to be a resistor. And you know, to me, it's deeply troubling. And it's deeply troubling because I think a lot of people come to politics because they believe that we can do better. I mean, President Obama, the reason I got involved in the campaign early, and the reason I was so inspired by him every day is he, would try to drive towards this hope, the world as it should be. And I know that Alyssa, you and I have talked about like, if the world is as it should be, it needs to include all of us. And so we've got to figure out a way to respect people's very different opinions. So first and foremost, I want to say that Alyssa is still very conservative <laughs> and I am still very liberal <laughs> and that's okay. So, um, you know, I think both of us are women who have seen the highest level of power. I mean, when you get to the presidential power, there's nothing like it. And um, you realize the responsibility of that office and of the people around it. And I think both of us have seen some alarm bells that um, foreshadow something that could be worse on the horizon. Yeah, and part of why we wanted to talk to you guys today is that, you know, the bad news, if we're going to be frank with you, is I think both of our political acumens tell us things might get worse before they get better. Just being very candid with you, I'm speaking from my party, I'm a Republican, I'm a conservative. I've been a Republican longer than Donald Trump was. I think he's very much running for president again. Um, I think that comes with many grave concerns. I think on the left that there is a tendency at times to go to the farthest end of the spectrum and an unwillingness to necessarily participate and work together in a bipartisan fac uh, fashion. And I think that this puts us in a moment where we're being governed by the polars of both sides and it's keeping us from getting the, the biggest issues of our time solved. You know, look at Capitol Hill right now, we're trying to advance an infrastructure package. You pull any American and most of us can agree that we need to deal with the existential infrastructure problems that we have, but we're not doing it. Instead, we're bickering over different partisan preferences and I'm not saying there's an easy solution here. It's not as simple as if, you know, good Republicans sit down with good Democrats, we're gonna solve it all. But it begins with ringing the alarm bells of the fringes of both sides and the dangers that that pose to our institutions and to our future. And one thing that I will say, so the bad news being, I think it does get worse before it gets better. We agree on that. I also think it can get better with your generation. Speaking specifically to this group, it's really important, I think, 
that we, uh, we know that young people on some of the core issues facing our country are actually more united than they are divided. Um, you guys are the most educated generation. You also have access to information in a way that is not even understandable to generations before you with the rise of you know, the internet and social media with all the downsides that come with that. You're an incredibly inclusive generation that doesn't even know a world um, you know, that our, even our generation and our parents did where certain things weren't acceptable in the public square. But you're also, I think, a generation that believes in freedom and in liberty. And so for some of you, that's gonna take you the Republican route. And for others of you, it's gonna take you the Democrat route. But my- Democratic. <laughs> Democratic but my, route. My, 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 our, pitch, <laughs> our pitch to you today is whichever direction your future takes you, do it in good faith and yeah. being willing to talk to people on the other side and to try to see, you know, their life experiences may have brought them somewhere different than you, and it may have made them register for a different political party. But if we're going to solve the biggest issues of our time, you have to have those conversations with the other side, or frankly, we're screwed. So step back and talk about, because you were uh, the Pentagon press secretary, which is a hugely important role for our nation's security. You traveled around the world. Um, in heels, both of us <laughs> traveling around the world in heels. It's a, uh, you know, uh, it, tell me about what you saw in terms of distrust in institutions. That's a great question. Um, and I would actually start ahead of that. So for, for me, my background was always kind of in partisan politics prior to my job as the Pentagon press secretary. I'd worked for Republican members on the Hill. I worked for Vice President Pence. Um, I, I always had a keen understanding of the role of public service and what that meant to me. But when I went to the Department of Defense, I knew I was in a nonpartisan role. I was wearing the, the shirt, the hat, and the flag of the United States of America. And it was a completely nonpartisan role where I would not bring politics into the job. And that for me was a very kind of pivotal moment in my life of understanding when we need to be able to leave those partisanship you know, issues at the doorstep. So when you're you know, traveling all over the country representing the US and our interests, whether it's with our allies and our friends or with our adversaries, knowing your American spirit, your values, what we stand for is so fundamentally important. And it also gives you this appreciation. I mean, you, you've you traveled to as many countries, if not more than I have with President Obama, but it gives you this unique understanding of how special it is to be an American, which we can so often take for granted. And I'm the first to say we've got a thousand issues we've got to deal with, but there are just some very key core values that we have and benefits that we have as Americans that you often don't see when you're abroad. Um, and I would also say it, it gave me a clear understanding of the, in, the importance of the U.S.'s role in the world. Um, something Johanna and I talk about very regularly is We've got this domestic issue that we have to deal with, our hyperpolarization, where you know the right hates the left, the left hates the right, neighbors don't speak to neighbors. But there are much bigger issues than just the domestic ones. We're in an existential global battle right now with the rise of China and the rise of Russia, two nations that don't share our values that we are going to have to deal with. I hope we do through diplomacy. I hope we do it wisely. But if we can't even agree on who we are as a country, we are going to get outmaneuvered at every corner around the globe. And suddenly the values that we hold dear, freedom, human rights, the right to religion are going to cease to exist in a generation or two. Well, and that's what I would add is that, you know, I still believe to this day that we have more in common than we disagree on. We very much like both of us have seen the role of press, the freedom of the press in this country it's unique, it's important, it is, you know, holding power accountable is really like the most important thing we can have to have a fundamental uh, understanding of our democracy. Um, you know, freedom of religion is incredibly important. The freedoms that people have to create businesses, solve problems, lift people out of poverty, like these kinds of things have spurred generational growth that spurred our economy and it's gotten us to the place where America, I think sometimes we don't realize how lucky we are. Mm -hmm. And then you travel around the world and you realize so many places, you know, there's no whistleblowers, mm -hmm. you're killed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, these things are really important that we continue to find ways to bring people together. And I think there's a lot of people tuning in right now to the voices who say the other side is all wrong and I've got all the solutions for you. 
And there's, you know, my frustration with that is I want to see more people have a conversation. Like I say, I would have a conversation with Marjorie Taylor Greene. I would have a conversation with Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. They're all elected by different constituencies. And why? Because they wanted their voice at the table. Now the important part is not yelling at each other, but trying to understand each other. Well, and I love that point. So I've, Johanna's heard the story a thousand times, but I, it, it was a moment that I was in the Oval Office under President Trump, and we were, we were dealing with a, a major foreign policy moment that had significant repercussions, potentially, if depending on what direction it went. But it was in that moment that it finally hit me that I left that job a conservative, but anyone that leaves working in the highest levels of government completely partisan or even more radicalized in their own beliefs and doesn't have a level of humility about how difficult the problems that face us are, they shouldn't be the people in public service. Like I've got my general political views, but I can tell you the problems facing our country that make it to the Oval Office are so much more complicated than any one party has all the answers to. And any politicians who are telling you that, you know, we're heading into a campaign season, we're going to hear everyone's stump speech about how everything would be all better if they if they were the one in charge, it's not the case. And we need to stop, you know, cheapening how we speak to American voters because our problems are real. We've got to deal with them, whether it's the threat of climate change, national security matters like the rise of China, or just the fact that our economy doesn't work for half the country. And we've got to correct that. We've got to lift people out of poverty. And we're not doing that. No, we're not focused on our problems. We're focused on personalities. And I think, you know, so we started talking about some of the good news is if the two of us who worked for very different administrations, if we can find not only the similarities in each other, but also the similarities in our experiences with the administration. We started talking at the beginning and we can get into some of your questions, but I've started listening to Stephanie Grisham's book. And um, of course she was a White House press secretary under Trump. And what dawned on me was some of the similarities actually of the level of arrogance in which a new victor of a campaign comes into the White House and how they think they can do everything better and how they try to reinvent the wheel when really we need to beef up the wheel together. Um, you know, the, there's a lot of good news, but I think there's more bad news, unfortunately. I do, I think Donald Trump, you know, in Iowa this weekend, um, he uh, continues to get, I, I'm from Galesburg, Illinois. Galesburg's the place that voted for Obama and voted for Trump. My family's divided. Personally, it affects me. Um, I see a lot of people saying President Trump could do this better, not looking at the facts of what are the issues that we're dealing with, but President Trump could do it all better. And when it's a personality and it's not debating the issues, like what do we want to do, then you're going to side with one person or President Biden's doing it all right. You know, anything, anybody who's saying these different things. The, the truth is more nuanced. You know, I don't agree with my husband on everything. I won't agree with Alyssa on everything. I won't agree with colleagues on everything. We should have our own voices and we should use them. The bad news is we're about to see politicians on the rise again tell you that they're going to solve their problems. And I think that President Trump is the de facto uh, president in the Republican Party. They are going to, they, like the election maneuvering, I'm very worried about because I think that it's going to so distrust whether or not um, people, you know, believe that they're making the election more secure or not. The talks about the election process and everything is going, it's already sowing distrust. And the next issue is that the majority of people believe that violence is their route to solving for those issues. Um, that is really troubling. So, you know, to the extent that we need to rebuild trust in institutions, um, I think that the younger generation that is currently in the ivory tower, and look, like I, my Galesburg, Illinois, there weren't a lot of us going to Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like a route, it was Carl Sandburg Community College. And, you know, I think it's actually really important to go engage people, not just have the intellectual debates at your university, but really engage people on what we want our future to be. You know, I believe still that people want an opportunity of jobs, that they want an opportunity to live the American dream, that they want to have their family and that they want to have some freedoms. Um, and, you know, like the question is like, what does that mean for each person is different, you know? And 
Um, and we can try to come together and find those areas of agreement. But because we have this record to hide distrust, we had an assault on our capital. We have debates over vaccines. We have debates over masking. We have debates on everything. And because of all of this, I, I fear for our future unless all of us get involved and make bipartisanship actually, I guess, um, attractive in different ways. Where can we come together? How can we use our voices together? How can we grow the coalition that actually cares about solving America's problems and not just fighting? In, in a point that Johanna and I often make is that um, in my party, we'll often talk about the silent majority. And what that usually means is a bunch of conservative members of the base that are going to turn out in elections. I don't know if Democrats have a term for it, but I truly believe the silent majority of this country are moderate people of good faith in both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party who want to see institutions work. They want Congress to do their job. They want the federal government to work when it's supposed to, whether it's public health, like we're seeing during the pandemic, whether it's the military having a role, you know, in terms of national defense and homeland security and having, you know, the basic social safety network work. But we're in a moment, and this could be attributed to countless things, where it's the polars of both sides that are dictating so much of where our future is heading. And um, just to touch briefly on something Johanna said, because it's something we discuss a lot, is, is insti our institutions. Um, I think that they're under attack um, in, in domestically within the US. I think our own citizens have distrust in them. I think our adversaries exploit that distrust. And I will say this without equivocating, nothing was like January 6th. That was an assault on our democracy. It was an effort to overturn, um, overturn the constitutional process of the election, and it was terrible. Um, I will say that we have what I would call raising of questions, of, um, questioning our institutions on both parties that I think we really need to consider. I'm not going to tell you what to think, but I would give you the food for thought on this. Something that Democrats have been um, discussing in some circles, I've not seen it yet, you know, mainstream legs, but it's something that I've seen, you know, former presidential can candidate Hillary Clinton talk about is um, eliminating the electoral college. You all are smart people. Um, we have seen this experiment work in history in other countries, a direct democracy, a one person, one vote. It's essentially generally led to mob rule. I actually think it's an extremely extreme position to have that we should eliminate the electoral college. But what's happening is in the last, I would say, you know, five to 10 years, that started to come into the mainstream of liberal thinking. On the, the Republican side, we have more problems than I could rattle off for you, but I will name a few. The distrust in the elections and that process, it is dangerous. We saw the consequences on January 6th. We have to combat the, that disinformation and that distrust in the basic process whenever we can. But much of that does fall on our elected officials and on our public servants to, be, to share the vital information that the public needs to hear that's going to create trust in those institutions. I think that we, on both sides, we need people of good faith willing to be honest about why things work, why things don't, and be willing to call out wrong information on both sides. But we tend to just retreat back to the polarity of both sides, and I think it has very, very bad consequences. Well, and I was, I was reflecting as a woman, you know, I realized, like, I met Dee Dee Myers, first female press secretary. Um, she's... It wasn't that long ago <laughs> that we had the first female press secretary in the history of our country. Um, then, you know, we didn't have a female press secretary. The entire eight years of the Obama administration, we, um, you know, and I think there were a lot of people like right after Trump won, there was this um, event that I went to and they were like, how many men in your administration grabbed them by the, and I was just like, my jaw could have hit the ground because a number one we had problems with sexism we had problems with people you know not taking women seriously in our administration and so first i want to say like unfortunately probably there was too much misogyny in every administration and um and then you know you get to this point where uh you see then president trump like had some incredibly brilliant women around him and they come out and they speak their minds and they don't always agree with him. And all of a sudden everybody piles on. And I am tired of women getting all of the blame and none of the credit. 
because actually women in Washington are some of the people who are making things work, who are coming together, who are building consensus. And so I do believe, you know, in terms of like the, the breaking glass ceilings, um, we saw during our administration, you know, we had a government shutdown. We've had, now had multiple government shutdowns. You had my government well shutdown. Well acquainted with that. Like everybody gets a government shutdown. <laughs> And it doesn't work. It doesn't work for Americans. But um, but actually, during our government shutdown, it was women who were leading those negotiations to bring people together to try to figure out how could we actually get the government reopened. Um, I think it's going to be really important that women use their voices in this election. And look, I will talk to any Trump supporter, and I will talk to them about why I disagree. I think he raises some really good points that we should consider. I think he is a person who is out for his own best interest and he cares about his own power. And I've seen it in the Democratic Party and I've seen it in the Republican Party. And it is scary when you have a leader who is so uh, focused on their own um, image and their own um, you know, power that they get lost in you know, what it actually means to govern and do the job for the American people. I, I think he's coming back and I think that we should all worry about that. Now, I know um, we wanted to talk about some of the things that we do have hope for. <laughs> Before we conclude this very, you know, dark uh, moment. But I think, you know, I want to be, I, I want to be very, like, I've had longer to reflect on leaving our administration than you've had. You've just left the administration more recently. And I think there's a lot of people who go back and say, oh, we were so perfect. We could do it, you know, so perfectly. And the other administration was so messed up. And in so many ways, I think actually we laid the groundwork for some of the stuff that President Trump did and some of the stuff that he got away with. And I find that deeply troubling. And I think that we need to change that behavior on both sides of the party aisle for us to move forward in a way we can actually govern. Well, and that's a very good point because something that I generally don't hesitate to criticize the Biden administration, but the one area that I've been um, very tepid in criticizing them is the coronavirus response. I lived it. I was there when we were making very, very tough decisions, whether it was dealing with supply chain issues where we were worried the entire Eastern seaboard wasn't going to ha have access to basic food products, or when we were having runs on different, you know, essential goods. We were nowhere near a vaccine, we were nowhere near therapeutics, and we were losing, you know, a Pearl Harbor a day, to put it in context of Americans, a tragic period. And it there is so much we could have done better in the Trump administration. I'm the first person to say it. I I proudly was someone who begged him to wear a mask and told him how great he looked in it. But I will say this: public health is such a challenging issue because even if you do everything right, we are a country where we have freedoms. We have also a federalist government where states have authorities that the federal government doesn't have. I personally think that's a good thing, but a challenge I've seen the Biden administration have is one that we knew we were careening into in the end of the Trump one. We were so thrilled that we were getting a vaccine. That was the dream for that entire period is yes, we're finally gonna get a vaccine safely to market. Yet now we're, nine months, 10 months after the fact, and only 53% of the country is fully vaccinated. And we know a lot of those people are Trump voters. They're people who supported him, who somehow there is a disconnect between the fact that he oversaw getting that vaccine to market. But we knew then it was going to be an uphill battle to convince vaccine skeptics to get it. And, and you know, my, my words with the Biden team, I think there's more they could do, but there's vaccine skeptics on both sides. And mm -hmm. there would have been just equal amount of people who distrusted who had distrust in a Trump vaccine. And I think when we don't admit that, we continue this like, you know, cycle of distrust. And I think we have to admit to that. The hope I would have is I actually still believe that America's best days are ahead of us. I believe that when we embrace our diversity, we have diaspora communities from all over the world. We are the world's richest nation of diversity of talent. If we empower that human capital in America and we let people solve problems, the largest global challenges, the fact that we have more than a billion people without clean water, we've got billion people without housing. We have around the world these epic challenges. If we come together and we solve those problems, I believe that we maintain our economic dominance, but we also actually have more moral clarity. And with that moral clarity can lift up more of the globe. And that is the, what the world 
that I believe it is as it should be that includes all of us that I believe your generation could help us get to. Well, I couldn't have said it better myself. And I would say this, um, I continue to believe there's so much more that unites us than divides us as Americans. I do think at times we have to remind ourselves that though. I think that we live in a moment where division is in vogue and it's what we think is, it almost is a way of differentiating ourselves and creating identity. But I think remembering our core values and what we believe in in this country and being willing to defend them is, is what we need to, to really have take priority. I'd say this though, um, to Johanna's point that what makes me feel better about our country is the next generation. There are certainly things I have concerns with, um, but you all are, you're highly educated, you're global by, you're essentially global. That is just how you've been raised, that you can communicate with people all over the world and have access to information all over the world. And I think that you are built into, it is built into who you are intrinsically to you know, want equity, to want equality, and to want good for the communities around you. I see it in the activism I see with young people. I personally work mostly with conservative and Republican activists, but I am I feel emboldened and good about the next generations of leaders. But the most important bit that I would leave you with is don't retreat to your partisan circles. Um, you know, if you if you're a, a liberal or a progressive and you've never asked yourself or tried to ask someone else, like why did you support Trump and go in with a listening heart wanting to know why then you're doing yourself a disservice. And to, to my conservative friends, if you've never sat down with a Democrat and say, you know, how, why did you support this person? What brought you to this conclusion? You've also done yourself a disservice. We've got to know each other as Americans, as this beautiful, diverse, you know, nation that we are, and, and try to find the common good in one another, or we are going to end up in a place where we don't even want to know what it might look like in 10 years. So I know we want to take your questions. We got a couple questions before here this uh, from our audience that's here with us. Um, we had, uh, how can you be such good friends with such different views? And the truth is, it's respect. I have respect to know that Alyssa is going to make the decisions that are in her best interest. I hate when people say, you know, oh, they're making a vote in, that's not in their interest. I don't know Alyssa's interest. I don't know any Republican's interest. I don't know a Democrat's interest. I'm gonna trust that they, you know, with all the information that they're able to get, they're gonna come with a viewpoint that I wanna listen to. And, um, and so I have terrific respect. I also have terrific respect for you, Alyssa, for it was, a global pandemic that was, it would have been difficult for any administration. You had asymptomatic spread, you had a country that China completely covers up anything that they don't want to be known. There was a president who was more focused on trade war and less focused on the global health component. And, you know, the truth is, any president would have been balancing everything. So, you know, for us to say, oh, a Democrat would have handled this perfectly and Trump was a complete and utter mess is not true. Um, this would have been hard for anyone. What we need to do is come together, find those solutions. We have a vaccine, the vaccine works. I ended up vaccinated, I got COVID in July. My son who's not vaccinated got COVID we may still end up getting COVID vaccinated. I texted my brothers who are not vaccinated, who are Trump supporters. And they said, oh, ivermectin, vitamin D. And it's like, why, why do you believe this? So, you know, what has happened is unfortunately they ended up one of them in the emergency room for getting COVID. And I don't want people to have to learn by ending up dead. So I do hope that we end up trying to find more ways to listen. I'm going home for Thanksgiving. I'm going to have lovely conversations with my brothers. I would wear a mask. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes, definitely a mask. But I think, you know, like we are in a situation where we need to have those conversations. The other thing we got was um, the question about women. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, I, I, I really think people think, oh, that the Obama administration empowered women. And I, I want actually us to remember that some in the Obama administration empowered Cuomo. So please don't give us a pass. We had some incredible women in our administration. Um, we need to do better 
for everyone's right um, and call out the hypocrisy in our own parties. Yeah, it's it's culturally, it's institutionally, it's everywhere. Um, my my White House certainly had no shortage of its issues, but I was I was recently asked. I was during the Cuomo scandal, and I say this: um, men in power abusing that power and taking advantage of women is politically neutral, party neutral. We've seen it on both sides. It does not discriminate. And also women being unfairly discriminated against in the workplace happens across the country all the time. We've made huge advancement, huge advancements. Um, it is it is great. It is a good thing that the Obama administration empowered so many women. I believe it was a great thing when we did in the Trump White House and in the Trump administration. And when I was at the Department of Defense, I loved seeing we had not as many women as we should um, in, in as we general have officers. To go there. We have much further to go. But <laughs> Loved when I worked with my female generals um, and, and civilian leadership. Um, but both, I'd say this is an issue that nobody gets a pass for. We need to elevate women. Well, more. and that's the other thing is I would encourage, like when I reflect back, um, I think uh, there's more to do in terms of throwing yourself into service in this country. Um, and, you know, I think uh, a lot of people who are at universities do go into politics. I think that it's equally as important to go into our military and to go into all the branches of service. Um, I want to, I actually, I want to see some sort of a service requirement in which we have a Peace Corps, Teach for America, AmeriCorps, um, or military service at 18 years old for every person in this country. I would support a universal college tuition if there was a requirement for any of the, the service. Yeah. For so service. we can find <laughs> consensus. I believe everyone else can. Yes. Um, I was going to say, uh, Amen, I know you're probably going to um, be taking some questions. Uh, Justin, I saw which Republican and Democratic candidate uh, on uh, are we most excited about for the future? And I was actually thinking, I wonder if. I named a Republican and you named a Democrat. Because <laughs> actually I was I was impressed with Tim Scott. Mm -hmm. I have a very different point of view from him. He did the speech um, after the first State of the Union or the uh, speech uh, to the joint session. And, um, you know, I think he has a different belief. He believes that churches and charities in this country are very important. And I believe they're very important. I think that they didn't um, create our unfair tax code. And that right now, because of the tax code and everybody giving their own little benefits, we've got you know something that's less fair than a flat tax would be, which is crazy. Um, but I also respected him that he said, this is gonna be the last selection that he's gonna run in because he doesn't believe that you should be a forever politician. And I'll say like having worked in the world of politics and then leaving the world of politics, it is so good to leave the world of politics for people to live in the regulated world that they are creating. And we were talking earlier, we've got, you know, uh, Grassley in Iowa running for a term when he's 88 years old. He doesn't believe anyone in Iowa could do it better than him. That's messed up. <laughs> Let's just call it out. And with due respect to Chairman Grassley, I think it's time for some new blood. And, and surely in the great state of Iowa, there, there could be. I will say the same about governor. Pelosi. I love her. I think she's an icon and I think she's wrangled more Democratic votes for strong priorities and one on issues that are important to me. But I think it's actually time to pass the torch. Mm -hmm. I, on our Democratic side, love Karen Bass. And I'm really excited that she is running for mayor of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I think you're going to see some of our most powerful Democrats actually get power in local mm -hmm. elections. Um, and I'd like to see what they do with it to see who should emerge on the national stage. You, that, that's De Democrat. Democrat. First, well, <laughs> Democrat first. So I was uh, going to say Congressman Tim Ryan, who's also running for Senate in Ohio. Um, granted, he, he is a moderate, but he's somebody who I think represents the, you know, blue bell uh, working class, the, the, the core of what this nation was. And my, you know, with due respect, criticism oftentimes of, of liberals is the elitism of the coast, that it seems so often they're catering to Los Angeles and New York and just have such a misunderstanding of what the middle of the country is like. 
he seems to intrinsically get that. That's something Joe Biden had very well. That's, um, I mean, I knew that was gonna be his, what would get him Pennsylvania, um, make him formidable in Ohio as well. And I'm seeing it become a lost art in, in progressive circles. So I think Tim Ryan, someone formidable, Karen Bass is a good one too. Um, I also just sidebar, because I know this wasn't the question. If we eliminated our general, um, our, our primaries, we would have a country where a Joe Manchin would get elected by like 70% of the country if we just eliminated primaries altogether, because actually like moderation is not seen as a bad thing by most Americans. You can have open primaries and allow people to vote in every primary. I, there are some election reforms that would be really important. <laughs> and, and I actually, I wanna see digital voting. If I can pay my taxes online, I should be able to vote online. I believe like we can move to a world in which it's secure. There's blockchain technology in which there's multiple digital records. They literally had West Virginia had voting of overseas military members through blockchain voting. There were not flaws in that system. I would like to see in the future, but I don't think we're there, unfortunately. Um, I think it were, it'd be so ripe for, for cyber attacks and at a time when there's just so little trust in our institutions, but I would like to see us get there and then quickly, I'm not to steal your answer. Um, Tim Ryan, someone, uh, or sorry, Tim Scott is someone I would love to see run as the Republican. I think he's inspirational. Um, he, I worked with him during the previous administration on opportunity zones, which is basically his whole vision is understanding there's a lot that divides us, but what generally Americans want is prosperity and the shot at their American dream. So he believes in, you know, public private partnerships with the government and, you know, investing capital in underserved communities and inspiring businesses to go there. And I think that was one of his kind of biggest policy accomplishments, but I also found him to be a very good actor when we were trying to deal with uh, policing reform, which is one of the most challenging issues you're going to deal with hyper divisive and I always saw him to be an honest broker whether he was dealing with the most right wing politician or the most you know progressive that you could find yeah. in the Senate caucus and that to me is refreshing. And thank you both so much for for your insights there. Um, we are we do have a few questions on our end um, that our folks would love to ask you. Um, so first I'm just going to turn the camera over to Shira who is a first year at um, the college and also a new member of Tuck. So Hi, thank you guys so much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Thank you guys so much for coming to speak with us today. This has been a really amazing opportunity. One thing I'm curious about, as somebody who's kind of interested in maybe going into the press or into journalism or into public service, as a, as a woman, I feel like often I have to kind of temper my, my passion for something or my desire to interrupt somebody to insert a point or I guess kind of like pay attention really to how I speak and especially like in the press room. Um, I know that women can come across at saying the same thing as men very differently just because they're women. And so I'm curious how you kind of handled that in your professional careers. That is a fabulous question. Um, a, pursue it. I think whether it's journalism or public service or politics, um, all so important to our institutions and to our country. Um, it is very true. Women can say the exact same thing and it's perceived as whiny or it's perceived as emotional. And I have found that um, you, it is unfortunate that you have to try twice as hard as men do to be taken seriously, to be given that seat at the table and to even when you have it, be listened to at the same level. But honestly, to me, I don't have a magic remedy. I would say just respectfully and smartly bulldoze your way in and make clear that you're not moving and keep those shoulders firm and be there to ask the tough questions, to hold people accountable. I can't tell you how many times you know, I was the shortest, youngest, most female person in the room chiming in with whether it was four stars or the president of the United States saying like, I've got another idea, please listen. And you just go and you've just got to force your voice to be heard. And you sound like somebody who would be very comfortable and strong at doing that. I also would add find allies. Like that's mm -hmm. one thing, you know, I had, uh, there was a guy, I remember he was always like, Johan's so aggressive. That's always a, you know, oh, women are so aggressive. A man can say the same exact thing, but he's not aggressive. And it was like, okay, well, you know, whatever the case is. And you get upset, right? And you just try to like brush it off and then you get more like, you know, I'm going to find people, I'm going to hire them, I'm going to get the highest ranks. And you can, you can do that. I think actually building allies and trying mm -hmm. to understand, um, trying to, you know, sometimes you're not going to change people's perceptions. They have their own experiences in this world, but um, trying to build allies so that you can get through to them in a different way. 
so that maybe they can start understanding your story and you can start understanding their story and understanding why they feel so intimidated by a strong female presence. Um, so I, I think building allies is really important. And female mentorship, I would add to that, I think is so key. Yeah. Um, like Dana Perino was somebody who was always so helpful to me when I was in the White House, but people who've been there and been in those shoes who can just help you navigate those tough moments is invaluable. And also male mentors mm -hmm. too are really important. And I think that, you know, we have to be careful to, um, you know, not do the disservice to equality when we're trying to find the people who are going to agree with us on different things and who are going to be our mentors. Fantastic. Um, thank you both for, um, for your thoughts there, especially as we see every consecutive congressional class include more women. I think it's a really important thing to take into account. Um, but our next uh, question is going to be from Rue. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Rue. I'm also first year and a new member. Um, uh, that's I'm from Texas. I guess that's the other piece of relevant information about me. Um, thank you again for, for doing this. I think this is such a, an amazing opportunity to get to hear from y'all. Um, my question is about, y'all were talking about the cheapening of the political narrative and the way that politicians avoid talking about nuance and how that sort of leaches into the way that um, their constituencies think about political issues. And um, I just wanted to ask like, how do you think that should be handled? Because it seems to me, and, and of course I don't, I'm no expert, but just, from living life on the ground as a political entity, it seems like voters don't really want nuance. It doesn't seem to sell very well. Um, and they especially don't want people to admit that they don't, they don't like humility either, it seems like. So, so what do you think is the right way to balance, you know, how do I actually win an election versus being honest, being humble and, and um, being nuanced? I believe that true leadership is being brave and brave enough to trust that you can do things differently. And um, the yes, you're absolutely right. Bipartisanship is not in vogue. When we do things together, we do not get nice notes from our colleagues. <laughs> it's like, why are you doing that? Sometimes you get a few nice notes. It's not like, oh my God, we should all join in this. <laughs> But you have to be brave enough to know that it's important. I don't believe Washington DC will change itself. I actually believe that while laws come from east to west, change comes from west to east. And I believe that the way we can change it is through media. We were talking about this before. I think that we need to talk about um, the issues that matter to the American people first. Um, I see a question about uh, middle class, um, and that is a huge issue. People are very worried about their child not having the same rights to the American dream as they've had. They want someone who's gonna protect that. They don't understand the nuance in terms of a trade war with China, but they want someone to protect that. So what happens is you have these strong men politicians who say, I'm gonna protect you, and I'm the only one who can protect you. And the BS in that is that no one person can protect you. Like the, so first we need to say what's not true, which is one person is gonna be able to solve all of our problems. Not gonna happen, any president. Right now we see a growing both sentiment of Democrats and the Republicans wanting the president to act alone. That's like, they'll say, just do it yourself. That's a problem. We want them to do it together because we wanna build the barriers that are really tough for one person to change because then you can have one person who's not a moral character who can tear everything down. So we can change that, I believe. Well, and, and Rue, it's a fascinating question and something I, I truly grapple with frequently and don't have the perfect answer to, but I would say this, um, the showboats, whether it's in politics or media, um, or, you know, political campaigns tend to get the most energy and they tend to consume all the oxygen in the room. And those are who we think of. Um, we've been, uh, we've both talked about how we've been in speaking panels where, you know, somebody goes on stage from the other party and does a big show of like, this is what I believe in. You're all wrong. You're all right. And then off stage, they're like, oh yeah. And like they and immediately no. the wool comes off. They admit what they actually believe. And I, I can't tell you, it was, it was a hard lesson to learn that a lot of 
the figures in media and in politics don't even really believe what they believe. But to your question, I believe that all politics is local, even federal and presidential politics. And having those real grassroots conversations are what are more likely to change hearts and minds than what's sprawling across cable news. Now, I think our media does need to correct. I don't think they're telling the stories of most Americans and we focus on things that are out of touch with the concerns of most Americans. But I truly believe personal on the ground conversations at the local level are what change more hearts and minds than anything. That's why we've got a, a billion dollar industry around you know, grassroots activism and GOTV. So that's my, if, if, if it's advice, it's keep conversations personal and local within your community, whether it's your Harvard community or back home in Texas. I also, I mean, I, I think going back to the media, um, I left the administration and I joined the LA Times when there was um, new leadership and they eventually tried to buy it. And they wanted to turn it into a nonprofit. They unfortunately were unable to do that. Um, but I do believe that um, something has to change because even in our administration, I was thinking back to the question that we got for the US press in China. They asked about why the New York Times was kicked out of China. They asked a question about themselves. Like, we got to change that. So we're sitting here at the National Press Club to engage both all of you and also the press on how can we change this together and how can we do better together. And we hope we, we live up to your expectations there. Um, we've got another question from Nick. Do you want to go ahead and ask? Hi, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Nick O'Hara, a current senior at Harvard College and major in government. And I'm also the current vice president of the Harvard Republican Club. So I was wondering, uh, you mentioned the importance of starting conversations across the aisle with colleagues and classmates. Any advice that you might have for how to start those conversations and how to reach out to those who have different views than you? Well, it's thank so you. great to meet you. And I, I'm glad to know that there is a small but thriving Republican group on Harvard's campus. Um, no, listen, um, this, this might sound trite, uh, but it, it really isn't when it comes down to it, which is in the same way that Johanna and I can have a friendship and we can talk about really important policy issues, ones that are very deep, serious and have major repercussions. We're able to do that because we have mutual respect and understanding for each other. And we're both humans who treat each other as friends and warmly and we don't need to, Listen, it doesn't mean a conversation is never going to get heated, but to go into a conversation, not with the idea to, you know, knock the other party over the heads and win the argument, but to actually understand what drives them and to, to respectfully just con contribute what your point is. It's, it's a lost art, the like the lost art of dialogue and discourse. And I think one thing, because, you know, you're, you're getting ready to graduate and you're going to head into the quote unquote real world. I would say, even if you if you are ever in the White House, wherever you may be, never let politics be your entire life. That was my saving grace in all of the, the work that I've done. If the fact that I could go home and care about other things, be passionate about other things, when really hard moments happen, whether it's January 6th or other things, I was able to you know tune it out and realize I have things I care about that I'm passionate about, that I'm invested in, whether it's charity, family, friends, you know, different interests that I have to be able to turn it off when you need to, because it's um, consumed too much of people's lives. Politics should never ruin friendships. It should never hurt families. In fact, it should be a constructive institution where we're able to bring people who disagree together. And, you know, sometimes we, we like to play the game, like we're going to disagree on three things, but find the one thing we agree on. Like I, I was on The View last week. I was stacked with liberals but I was able to agree with them on a couple of things. Like I was tried, outnumbered. Yeah, all you know, conservatives. Yeah. And I always tried to agree to find somewhere. Exactly. <laughs> so we do. We, yeah. we, but the, I think also you think that you're going to meet Democrats or Republicans by going to like Democrats or Republicans club or bipartisan club. You're going to meet them when you're out at events. You're going to meet, you know, people of different perspectives and immediately you're going to be like, oh God that person has different views. Like I just had a Uber driver pick up three of my girlfriends and he was Trump head to toe. He, he showed up with a Trump car, like literally his car was Trump. His hat was Trump. His cup was Trump. And my, my girlfriend, you know, was like, Oh my God. And I'm like, I want to understand. I want to understand what is his point of view. Like, where are we going to come together? And he said, Oh, this guy, he's great. He loves America. And I said, I love America too. Like, what can we do together to try to understand each other better? And I don't think 
we've quite done that mm -hmm. enough. I see a question from Zoom, from Amen. Yes, feel free to uh, unmute if you have your hand raised. Um, but I think we are, we, I know that we're also closing in on time. So we've got time for one last question if anyone in the Zoom would like to ask. Um, but I also want to open it up to you both to um, communicate any closing remarks, any final thoughts that you'd like us to take into, uh, take to heart as we hopefully move forward and, and continue to solve problems together. So. Well, thank you so much, Amen, and to the Harvard Bipartisans and all of the sponsors. This has been incredible and an important conversation. I'm so just really thrilled to hear from young people and young leaders who want to talk to people on the other side of the aisle. Like, it starts with you. You guys are the future leaders. It's not the 80-something-year-olds that we talked about that are going to be running the country down the road. It's people like you. So engage those you agree with, but engage those you disagree with. And pursue, I mean... I, I will never regret pursuing politics. It's my passion. It's something that drives me. I know you never will. Yeah. Um, but remember, at the end of the day, we're all Americans. Um, we can all have friendships beyond our political circles, and we can work together to solve the biggest issues of our time. We absolutely can. We absolutely will. Um, we just have to stop believing that the other side is all wrong, because they're not. And um, the only way we're going to truly make America the great place for everyone is when we start respecting everyone and trying to figure out where we can agree. Um, I, I know we didn't get to some of the questions. Um, I don't know if there were any last questions. I think not, not from Kim. Uh, I see. Okay. All right. So, perfect. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. I think that'll be a first for our Harvard event where all the questions are addressed, at least in the I was going to say, what happened here? <laughs> you have so, any follow-ups, you know how to find us. Yes, we're so thankful um, to have gotten to speak with you all today. Um, and thank you for dedicating some of your time to us in your evenings. Um, and also, obviously also for, for imparting many of your, your insights and experiences to us. We're really looking forward to applying them as we continue to work to create bipartisan solutions to the nation's biggest problems. Um, and without further ado, we also want to be respectful of everyone's time. So um, we will let you all go tonight and study for midterms. And, and thank you all again um, for joining us this evening. Thank Good luck. You. Thank you guys. Thank you very much. We're very grateful.